Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. Yesterday, we looked at a really great letter that the American Bankers Association wrote to the Federal Reserve, and it was about their request and their requirements for the faster payments in a domestic environment. And that was something that I think was really fun to look at. But today, I don't want to think in a silo because some people are thinking in silos, especially when we talk about banking, because banks are juggling many balls at the same time. And in yesterday's video, I never talked about using XRP as a bridge currency. I should have, but I didn't. And nor did I talk about Nostro Vostro accounts. I should have, but I didn't. The account, those Vostro accounts are what the banks have to tie up funds to settle cross-border payments. Now, yesterday, I only focused on the letter that the ABA had written to the Federal Reserve regarding the request for faster payments in a domestic environment. And so what I want to do today is look a little bit beyond that. When we talk about silos, where did that word come from? Jillian Tett wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Silo Effect. It's a good read. And what it means is that you have different people uh, in an organization or sometimes an individual who is not sharing information or is just focusing with not com communicating with coworkers or other people. And you get this breakdown of communication and efficiency, and it's called the silo mentality. So you can see in this illustration uh, quite well how she is describing the term. So when we look at the payments network, it consists of many layers. We now know as being followers of the company Ripple and the digital asset XRP that these several layers or each network, whether it's a uh, same region like a domestic banking situation or a cross-border situation where they are sending global remittances, each have a central counterparty with its own unique layers, making interoperability nearly impossible. So if you see here, the pieces of the puzzle don't fit. When you can achieve interoperability, you have components, products, or programs that work together, and it would look something more like this, where everybody is working together, the pieces of the puzzle are fitting and the cross communication, especially with today's technology in real time is possible. So when you go to the Ripple Insights page, who really cares about real time payments? Boy, you can learn a lot about this interoperability and banks need to remove payment friction, both domestically and in the cross border environment. And that's what Ripple can do. So it can be deployed as their technology for domestic single currency use case. Or in fact, Ripple can enable banks to conduct coordinated atomic transactions across the Ripple ledger privately with certainty and with scalability. That XRP bridge asset produces or gives access to immediate liquidity 24 by 7 by 365 for multiple currency settlement. So this is the picture. It's interoperability. It is the domestic and the global fitting together to provide the most efficient communication uh, and architecture of programming available today. Many central banks have examined their own national payments infrastructure and found a hodgepodge of systems. So this Faster Payments Task Force, which was launched back in 2015, they were hoping for adoption by 2020. Boy, it's getting close. Uh, currently, in the banks, they have built silos for each payment method. You have a silo for checks. You have a silo for credit cards. You have a silo for low value bank accounts. You have a silo for high value bank accounts. Each silo has its own messaging format.
And Ripple provides the architecture that can provide that messaging translation, the translators, they will translate to simplify the payment scheme with the ability to integrate into the legacy bank application. So Ripple can build a clearing and settlement system infrastructure that can be shared across domestic and cross-border payment services. And I think it's really important to understand that yesterday we focused pretty much on a domestic environment, but I want to tell you that it is much more complicated than that. Let's take a look at this scenario. A bank trader agrees at, to an overnight interbank unsecured money market transaction for same day value, okay? Currently, unless the operations department of the two banks separately coordinate on a specific settlement agreement, the receiving bank often has very little transparency on what time today those funds will arrive. Furthermore, the settlement might fail due to incorrect trade details entered on one side of the transaction, which could take hours to reconcile and amend. Sometimes the trade could even settle the following day and a borrowing bank could still need to pay the interest even without receiving the funds on the day the bank requested. So anticipating incoming payments requires substantial guesswork and significant resources are currently devoted towards anticipating the timing of incoming payments. These difficulties make intraday liquidity managers probably go crazy. Their jobs are extremely difficult when considering there are many different counterparties. So having a shared record between counterparties on a blockchain network could allow counterparty nodes to increase payment timing certainty between each other. And this is the kind of architecture provided by RippleNet. And the real-time cash forecasting is in the top three priorities for banks for the domestic transactions and for international global remittances. So when we add the international settlements, the modernization of the payment system is very important. So I'm going to the Accenture uh, PDF and you can see, okay, so let's just now today, let's add that other component. So banks have multiple currency Nostro accounts across the world with money constantly moving in and out. But many dashboards for managing these are national or regional and do not include collateral. So visibility is fragmented and only on the cash side. This lack of a single global viewpoint means that a bank can end up with a hundred million euros sitting in Frankfurt, but payments queued up in London, the, it doesn't work, right? So the answer is to bring all the account payments and related collateral into a single centralized dashboard so that at any point in time, the cash balance sheet and collateral balance sheet are fully visible. And this is just a you know small part of where the technology is taking us. Ripple, has provided through the SBI Ripple Asia, the very first mobile app that's going to be used in Japan for domestic payments. And then it's going to have the interoperability to go globally to provide those international global remittances using XRP. So I am not thinking in a silo and Ripple is not thinking in a silo. RippleNet can do both and does do both. And it's the beauty of the interoperability which brings so much value to this space. I'm gonna talk more about the MoneyTap app in a future video because this is really, really great stuff. All right, so yeah, you know, I just want everyone to know that it was really the smartphone that has driven the prolifer proliferation of this move to real-time experience for payments. And it is going to be that way for a while as the smartphone becomes 
more and more uh, integral part of our lives. So in summary, intraday liquidity monitoring we know is challenging. And really, it is very difficult to predict the requirements and managers are currently working in silos. That lack of uh, having an overall view can be overcome by leveraging blockchain technology and it, it will enable efficient, faster, more fluid and exact matching of the excesses and the deficits. So both the, on the domestic side of banking and on the cross-border side of banking, RippleNet is a beautiful solution. All right, so I feel better that I was able to really paint a larger picture, even though yesterday's uh, letter was quite good and it did really give us a lot of um, insight to what the banks need for a efficient environment. And um, yeah, I think now you really understand a little bit more as to the um, importance to utilize this blockchain technology in banking. Okay, we're going to the fluff, everybody. Oh, I I have one more one more point. This is a man I want to meet because he is not thinking in silos. So the CEO of Uphold uh, says that XRP can be used for domestic payments in the United States, ACH. Well, I don't know if that's the case. And maybe it's still to be tested and seen. And maybe for his business, it really will work. And many for, for, for many other businesses, it really will work. But the point is, is this guy is not thinking inside a silo. And we should remember that technology will evolve and we will continue to leverage the new developments that are coming down the pipe. All right, now we're jumping to the fluff. So when I think about silos, everybody, I think about sake brewing. <laughs> so you need to really come to Japan and taste some of the amazing sake. And it's not known as sake here. It's known as Nihonshu. If you order sake, you're going to get, they're going to look at you a little strange. You're going to get strange looks because it means just basically all types of um, alcohol or yeah, it's not specific. So if you're going to order Nihonshu, you're going to get one of the uh, wonderful drinks that uh, has been made here for over a thousand years and it since the 1600s it's really become a craft there are approximately 1500 makers and what makes a good uh, nihonshu is the water and the rice and it's uh, kind of the secret for that taste and if we look at the map here in the red areas is uh, the highlighted regions of Japan that are especially known for making great uh, Nihonshu. Even though Tokyo is here and not in the highlighted area, it is still, I think it has eight breweries. And so, you know, it can still be done, but these areas in red are really uh, fabulous. So when it comes to drinking Nihonshu, you should drink what you like. It doesn't matter. You can drink it hot if you prefer hot. You can drink it cold if you want to drink it cold. A light sweet taste or a bold, crisp, dry taste, it doesn't matter. So it's like wine. You can pair it to food if you like. And uh, even, gosh, um, craft beer now is being paired to food. But the most important thing is just to find one that you like. In Japan, the broth that's known as dashi uh, uses uh, nihonshu in its rest, you know, in its ingredients. So it is one of the staples in cooking as well here. So one interesting little fact is that of the 1500 brewers in Japan, there are only 12 women. It is traditionally a man's profession, 
but there are women who are breaking that mold. And if you do want to know my favorite Nihon shoe, it is Kubota. And they make some different um, lineups in their selection. And I think any of them are good. Uh, so I think if you are going to test one that I think you'll find very enjoyable, try Kubota. All right, everybody. That's all I have for you today. All right. Take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.